left, right. Generational differences, the great divide. Why does every generation look down on the next generation? Well, that's what we're discussing today. Let me know if you disagree. If you agree, let me know what generation you are and which generation you think is the best. This is Sip Talk. Grab a drink and enjoy. Cheers. 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 All right, we are alive. Welcome to Sip Talk episode 239. My name is Justin DeGiulio out of Sip Talk headquarters here in the office, my house in New Jersey. Uh, joined by James, the Bosnator Boswell, philosopher, philanderer, philanthropist, philatelist, man of many PH words. Uh, how's it hanging down there in not so sunny South Carolina? Good down here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rosh isn't able to join us tonight. So if you have comments, make sure to hit them on Twitch, YouTube. What are the other ones that we can see directly through the uh, the stream? Oh, if you're watching us on Instagram, you're watching us on TikTok, you should be watching us on youtube facebook twitter or twitch that way we can see your comments we can't see your comments on the first two platforms so youtube yep. facebook twitter twitch if you want to interact ask questions share your opinion yell at us just say mean things because last week's topic time. was the world going to war this week's topic is the generations going to war <laughs> the great the the great american divide the the generation gap um I have a I have a new location, uh, by the way, for the podcast. I'm now up in the office. I've uh, I've changed some things up here, um, trying to redo some some uh, area in my basement. So I will be here for the uh, foreseeable future. Um, I'm hoping the setup works, cast wise, audio wise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let's uh, uh, let's get into it then. So this topic was spurred today. When Rosh, who's usually joining us, he's a co-producer in the podcast, sent us a video. And the video was uh, something in the news. I think it was like Fox News uh, about employers calling millennials and young people lazy. And then it was someone flipping the camera around saying, here's why they're not lazy. Um, and he made some good points. Most of them I did not agree with. Um, and of course, I looked this guy up. And what his job is, from my understanding, is he's just a social media influencer with nearly 8 million followers. And he just has uh, these opinions. He posts them online. People interact. And that's where he gains traction. And Yo, I it didn't... blows my mind that that's now a career. Well, so that is a career. It's not an easy career. And I'm sure it's a lot of work for him. But it's not a traditional career, and most no. people don't have most people don't have that as an option to have eight million eight million dollars, eight million followers. Yeah, but it's still it's so odd to me because like, and and this is coming from someone who watches a lot of YouTube and I'll occasionally watch like some video games on Twitch, and so like the people that are playing video games on Twitch or the people that are producing videos on YouTube, I can understand that because like either they're doing research on a topic that's interesting to some people or like they're really, really good at video games and they're ma managing to make playing video games for others entertaining. But like, I, I, I still struggle to understand influencers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like what, what exactly are you providing here? Well, I think, I think the day of the influencer is, is really older because is over because there are so many of them. So you really have to have some type of niche opinion or sect to, to get into that market. So either you have funny jokes or you have a really wonderful sense of style um, or you have one particular topic that you just really kind of go all out on. But the idea of just becoming an influencer, kind of sharing your random things about your life, I don't really think that that's happening much more because there's just too many, too many people. So you have to be super niche uh, in what you're influencing. Yeah. I guess the market saturated in, in the, the kind of 
broad definition of influencer, but it's still just wild to me that there are people out there like that. It, but but it's also a full time job because if you're not producing content, multiple pieces of content on a daily basis, it's a full time job. You are forgotten about. Yeah, and I mean that's got to. I can't imagine that it's all that fun of a lifestyle. I because of the constant pr- pressure to produce and. And many of these people's lifestyles are the things that are on display. So you, you eat breakfast and it's not picture perfect. You got you to gotta dump that in the garbage can and remake that plate. Uh, that's that's a lot of stress. I, I will agree with you. Yeah, as someone who has literally never taken a picture of the food that they're about to eat. <laughs> I, it's, just, it's so foreign to me, man. Um, all right. So what I want to do for the sake of everybody listening is break down the different generations. Um, we're g- mostly going to talk about the more recent generations, um, but not the most recent generation. So I'll give you a list of generations. The greatest generation, 1901 19 to 1925, silent generation, 25 to 45, baby boomers, which would be a bigger topic of our conversation, 1946 to 1964, generation X. And this is what I always thought I was generation X. I guess I w- I'm wrong. 1965 to 1980. The millennials, 81 to 96, Generation Z, 97 to 2012. In the most recent generation, Generation Alpha, 2013 to 2025. And the reason yeah, we're, we're going to ignore about- Alpha because they're too young to be doing anything yet. And we're going to yeah, be yeah. ignoring the greatest generation because, they're well, they're dead. We have to have we have to be able to have interaction with with these generations to really be. I mean, we do talk about a lot of stuff on this podcast that we literally have. It's just speculating. Um, but I don't know too many people that are, you know, 12 years old and, and less, um, nor do I know anybody who is 100 years old or more. So, yeah, sorry, sorry folks. So, yeah, the, the greatest generation, I think we, we're, we're mostly going to skip. Um, but just for context, greatest generation, most of them grew up during the Great Depression. Most of them fought in World War II. Um, silent generation, there's not much. There's, there's not much historical context except that they were just sandwiched between the great well, generation. Some of the the silent generation would have grown up during the Great Depression as children. So, like the the Great Depression had a really profound impact on the way that people live their lives because, like, adults, if you were a young adult or a middle-aged adult and then the great depression hit like you suddenly had to completely rethink the way that you lived because you used to be able to just afford what you wanted and then all of a sudden you couldn't and so this is like the generation that would like buy a roll of paper towels but like only use like one quarter of a piece at a time because like they they grew up when they had to conserve because like they just couldn't afford food if they didn't and so if you were a child during that then you witnessed your parents doing those kind of behaviors just for the record historical inaccuracy i don't think there's any paper towels uh before 1945 just just a guess no but like (laughs) I, i i've heard stories of people talking about like their grandparents that were like young adults during the great depression doing that, like uh, of the whole idea of conserving. Yeah. Yeah. Rationing. Like maybe they didn't do it with paper towels in 1931, but like once paper towels are invented, they'd use like a quarter piece at a time because I think, I think it's just the mindset that they had to adopt and then they never shook. And I think really where that's going to come into play further into this episode is their impact on the baby boomers Mm -hmm. and, and just the mentality of the, of the baby boomer. Um, well, let's let's encapsulate because I really feel like the biggest the the biggest conflict right now is between baby boomers and millennials. So, but that would that would be roughly sixty years old to eighty years old. I think there's some overlap into into Generation X, those people that were born in the in the sixties. Well, and, and maybe early seventies. Yeah, but I and don't. And that, you know, also, there's spillover either way. Like the, that's what I was going to say. Is these aren't hard line generations. So, like older Gen X is going to be closer to boomers, and younger Gen X is going to be closer to millennials. Yeah, 
All right, sorry. Go ahead. Finish, um, <laughs> finish your statement there. Well, I, I think it's boomers look down on millennials, and millennials blame boomers for most or all of their problems. Yeah, but And why? I think both are right to a degree. But why do you think that is? Well... I mean, I, I, I agree. I think they're, they're both right. But, but what is the cause that, that's justified well, as, to, as to why Generation X looks down? Generation uh, X is in the middle of this one. I, I, I'm sorry. Boomers are, look down on Generation X and millennials. I think everybody does look down on the generation ahead of them ha- for having it easier, not having to work as hard. So I think the boomers were raised in a really unique environment. Because you had a confluence of factors. They were born just after World War II. And we're going to be talking just about the United States here because it, it matters in this discussion. Yeah, the United yeah. States, it, it just does. Yeah. And, and you'll understand why in about two sentences. Like After World War II, the vast majority of the developed industrial world was bombed to crap with the exception of the United States. And so as the world started to continue to, as the world continued industrializing, the United States had this huge leg up on the rest of the world in that our infrastructure was still intact and we didn't lose like a quarter of our population to war. So you had tremendous demand from places like Europe for all sorts of quality goods that to help them rebuild. And we had factories that weren't bombed. So we could make that stuff for them. So our economy in like the 50s and 60s was huge and growing faster than just about anywhere because we could do it. And it was an era where the tax rates were still relatively high. Compensation for employees, um, like inflation adjusted, was much higher than today. So you had relatively wealthy middle-class families and a relatively high tax rate. So that meant that the government benefits were generally pretty good. And so you had the boomers were growing up in this environment of basically the economy was on easy mode for them. And well, the, the United States grew so much in the last century, but it, but rapidly post world war two, whereas you yeah. a lot of the rest of the world and sure they got technology and things, that we got, but they didn't change that drastically. The landscape of the United States changed drastically. And that was, and it changed drastically while the boomers were coming of age. And so the boomers, and I'm, I'm, I will, I will die on this hill. <laughs> the, the boomers had an extremely easy environment to grow up, go to school and get a job that paid well in. Like it was very easy. That was an extremely easy thing to achieve as a boomer. As long as you weren't a degenerate or a deadbeat, you could go to school for cheap, get a house for cheap, and get a job that paid decently. And what mentality was instilled in your mind by your parents? Hold on to what you have. Don't take anything for granted. On that note, because well, no, that's actually super important. I want I want you to keep on talking about that. All right, we we can get back we can get back there. I will, I promise. But we're gonna miss it. If I got two, I got two bar trivia questions because I never gave the trivia question last week. So I'll give you one now. I'll give you the answer halfway through, and then I'll give you the new one for the week next episode. Because I really believe in this this bar trivia stuff. I think it's fun to run through these questions. And the question is very simple: the more it dries, the wetter it gets. The more it dries, the wetter it gets. And uh, I know what this is. All right. <laughs> all right. Sorry. So we'll, we'll hit the answer to that one in a little while. So back to back to the influence uh, on the boomers. Right. They had it pretty easy, but they have a mentality about them to hold on to what you have, to make it last, not to take anything for granted. Well, and it's because their parents came of age during the Great Depression. And so their parents' ethic was work really hard. And it could and make sure to hold on to what you have because it could all disappear because they they saw what happens when it does in 1929. Mm -hmm. And they also had like the boomers parents had to have this strong sense of self-reliance because nobody came in to save them during the Great Depression. They did have to survive. 
And you had to you had to you had to rely on those who had authority. If you questioned authority, the and, and you bit the hand that gave, there was no more giving. Yeah. There was no so, more receiving really for you. So the boomers were given that mentality, but without the actual environment that provided consequences for violating that mentality. Whereas mm-hmm. like Huh? So oh, I was going to say, which is how we sl- slipped into the next generation. But well, yeah, ahead. but and also like because um, the, the generation before the boomers like prioritize conformity really, really strongly. And you can think about like 1950 50s TV shows and like 1950s suburbia where like Everybody every home and Levittown, you like. <laughs> where every house looks the same and every yard is the same and every yard is mowed to one and a half inches exactly. And yeah, that's where most HOAs got their, got their rules. Yes. Um, and that was and and the boomers grew up in that and then eventually kind of rebelled against it in the late sixties and early seventies. Well, it wasn't the boomers, uh, rebel. No, it was the boomers. The boomers would have been like, Oh, actually, no. You're you that 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 is accurate. It's the, it's the boomers that were that were fifteen, sixteen, twenty, twenty two in the late sixties. Yeah, that's yeah. the boomers were the ones that went that that became the hippies. Yeah, um, because there there were, there were no repercussions for a lot of actions. They realized they could push the envelope a lot a lot harder, and they had they had uh, they could go to stores in this country where there was. Lots of items on the shelf. They could afford everything that was around. They were in a country that was growing. Uh, they were making money. They were buying cheap houses. Um, yeah, they also grew up in an environment where, like, if you were white, you had tremendous advantage because, like, you had some of the earliest housing programs would make it so that they, they their express goals were to make it easier for white people to buy houses. Well, also, just something that ran through my head was back then there was major differences in classes and races. Mm-hmm. So you, you you felt as if you were superior to others back then. Not that you were. You may have had it easier, but but there was major differences. Uh, and a lot of that. Oftentimes stuff. backed by the force of law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Many times backed by the. By the not, and we're not, we're not saying any of this was good. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying why some people may still feel that today is because especially the older people that's i think i said in our last episode how racism is not nearly as common as it used not that it's all going away but it's not nearly as common we're much more integrated than we used to be but but well, back i also then, think it's just shifted i think that racists have learned how to do it in a quieter way i mean the true racist people yeah you know, the ones that are really hatred hateful I think some other people, there may be racial injustices that are not people being truly hateful. Uh, you know, um, where am I taking this next year? Well, so I think here's the thing. The boomers were raised in an environment where everything came easy to them because of external factors. But they were told by their parents that what they did was because of their hard work. So they feel like they were really, really successful when they were playing the game on easy. And so they don't seem to understand. And this is the millennial opinion now is we played the same game that you did. You played it on easy. We've been playing it on hard and you don't understand why our scores are not as good as yours. Sure. Um... Because. And if I need to, I can pull up some of the data in terms of like the inflation adjusted cost of tuition and the inflation adjusted cost of housing and the inflation well, adjusted things, wages. In my opinion, time. in my opinion, these are the things that are going to break our country. These well, are the things that we have eviscerated the middle class and we continue to tax the middle class. Well, let's come back to that. But I, I think that if I needed to, I could make a really strong case that like all of these things are easy to, for the boomers. But they and so they're holding millennials to the same standard of success that they got to enjoy at whatever age, not understanding that to achieve that same level of success today is so much harder. Yeah, I mean, just when you when you look at uh, 
the home prices versus the average wages, mm-hmm. right? If you bought a if you bought a house in the 1950s or 60s uh, in the United States for sixty five thousand dollars, it could very well be worth one point four million dollars today in the right neighborhood. Well, and the thing I, is, yes, I wages were lower in the 60s, but like the ratio of the wages ratio to of house wage costs. To house, yeah, and that's what, that's what I'm getting at. And I can tell you in my neighborhood, that's the case. A lot of these people bought these houses that were new construction in the 50s and 60s, and they're selling for well over a million dollars, some of them, if they're on a nice piece of land. Um, and you're, the ability to buy a home back then, you could work in a shoe store and buy a home, you know. Uh, now you need to own the shoe store to be able to afford to buy a home. Yeah, um, and like one, here's one thing that I got. I, I actually had a conversation with someone who I would classify as a classic boomer, and the argument he was making was about um, it was about student loan interest and student loan debt, and saying like, why, why should there be any relief for student loan debt and why why are millennials complaining about student loan debt and, and not being and let able me, to afford it and let me guess my, my thinking is your argument against that was they were duped into the student loan debt thinking they would out earn their debt after graduation it's a big part of my argument yes okay. all right I'm, i was well, i just wanted just to think about it like when we were in high school yes beforehand how many times per year in high school were we told how important it was to go to college. Oh yeah, it was it was it was do or die. If you didn't go to college, you would basically live a rotting existence post high school graduation. Mm-hmm. It was it was you worked at McDonald's. If you don't go to college, you work at McDonald's. Yeah, it's you, you, you have no future if you don't go to college. But if you go to college, you will be guaranteed to have a good living for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. That was what we were sold, mm-hmm. and we were also sold. Sure, you should consider the cost of schooling to some degree or another, but you can get financial aid, you can get loans, and don't worry about the loans because you're going to get a good job after college and you'll be able to pay it off. Right? Uh, uh, completely, completely. That that was the, that was the sell to us is that so is that the value of college vastly outweighed the cost. So that's what was sold. You know what we ended up getting? Well, I know a whole bunch of people that have great uh, bachelor's and even master's degrees that can barely get a job. I know most of these guys can barely get a job in New York City to uh, afford to live in New York City. I'll give you an example. Uh, if 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 you want to get a, an apartment that costs two thousand five hundred dollars a month, you must be earning a hundred grand. So you have to have a decent job. The problem is we don't even have apartments right now priced at 2500 The cheapest apartment that we're doing in Manhattan is probably closer to 3000 maybe a little bit higher, which means you have to earn 120 to 140000 yeah. just well, to live in that city. Let me tell you a quick story because I graduated college in 2008, which is the exact year that the economy completely shit itself and didn't really recover for like five or six years plus, right? So one of my friends in college was a computer science major and took out student loans to finance his school and like got good, good, good grades, did everything that he was supposed to do, followed the guidance from high school, graduates, get a job in computer science in like three or four months, he's laid off. Why? Because every company was laying people off and he was one of the newest hires. He got laid off and it took him, I think close to a year before he was able to get a job in his field again. And his story is not unique. So many people our age went through that where they went to school. They did what they were told. They took out the loans because we can pay the loans back with our great jobs that we're getting after college. And then all those jobs disappeared and all those wages never actually came. So my generation feels like we were lied to and we were sold something that never existed. Yeah, I had a conversation at work today, though, about playing the victim card. And while I agree with you, that's the scenario, that can't be where the work ethic stops, right? There, there needs to be. No, but when it comes to, hey, I'm paying like 6 or 7% interest on two or $250,000 worth of debt that you told me I would be able to afford. 
then it's very easy to get mad no matter how hard you work to be able to try and get a job. Because you're seeing all of your income disappear into student loan payments that you were told wouldn't be a big deal. Yeah. And well, that's, you know, I think the people that do also, the people that have these giant student loans uh, really understand that. The people that don't have big student loans really don't understand why they're pushing so much legislation to wipe away student loans. Um, my thinking is just, again, this is going to be the demise of this country is that you have an educational system that to exist needs to be charging tens of thousands of dollars per semester. I, I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I understand that there's a cost. I think people should be paying it. I don't think we should, it doesn't make sense to just wipe away student loan debt um, because it's being, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. But I do think the absurdity of the high cost, and I'm not saying maybe it's not a good idea. I'm just saying the fact that we're in a scenario where we're looking at wiping away student loan debt is a, is a silly one because we let that happen. And that these institutions to continue to exist need to be charging so much money to to exist. Well, yeah. Um, and I don't want to get too bogged down in the student loan debate just because that, that could be its own episode. But I, I also think about... Um, like in terms of even getting a job today, like a lot of boomers grew up in, in an era where you could just walk into a place and ask for a job and have a reasonable shot at getting it. You know, what's really funny <laughs> is being able to walk into a place with a resume and expect these days, and this is not new, uh, expect these days that that's going to help you get a job. But th there was a time when that that actually did no, work. That, yeah, that, when I moved to when I moved to South Carolina, I woke up every day and spent time online sending my resume, and then I would spend a few hours during the day going business to business for businesses I thought I might be interested in working at, and dropping off my resume, which had very little <laughs> qualifications, I, don't, I suppose, at the time. Uh, and even then, and that was fifteen years ago. Um, even then, that was like, no, you just apply online. Why? why well, I can't help you. I just work. In the yeah, class. but I mean, if you go another twenty or thirty years back, that was kind of how it was done. That was, that was very common. Well, the internet didn't exist. Well, right. Internet, but so. like, I think a lot of boomers haven't had to go through the experience of what modern job seeking is. And I, I've read plenty of stories of like boomers, like it's basically like millennials talking about like their boomer parents having to go back out on the job market and just being mm. completely confused by like, well, why can't I just like drive down there and give them my resume? Well, no, mm. you have to apply online. And then, then when they actually, when they actually have to go through the processes that we're all used to, they're just like, this is utter bullshit. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is, but it's also, it's, it's probably tougher for them to stomach uh, because it seems well, so far. It's, it's always the case where like, it's not a problem in, until it affects you. <laughs> yeah, but I think a lot of the frustration for boomers and even millennials, uh, or I'm sorry, and even Generation X in the workplace is how, once these people get these jobs, how they behave when they hold them. So I think, again, this is like the boomers for the for the majority of their time in the workforce we're in an era where being loyal to the company and holding the same job for decades was what was kind of expected and to some degree or another rewarded by the company right mm -hmm. and i think the the real big change in that was probably nafta why do you think that because I think NAFTA was early 90s, I believe, early or mid 90s. And when with, with NAFTA, it like one of the consequences of NAFTA was that it made it much easier for U.S. companies to offshore their jobs. Okay. And so once companies could more easily offshore their jobs to places where labor was cheaper, mostly Mexico, then all these all these boomers 
uh, well, yeah, a lot of boomers got laid off because their job got replaced by somebody in Mexico making one fifth to one tenth the amount that they were making that, that that the company was paying here, and so that's kind of become the the new normal. Is that there's very little loyalty reciprocated. Like you can be a loyal employee, but that doesn't mean that the company is going to be loyal to you. And millennials, and especially Gen Z are very aware of that. And so I, I think our generation and Gen Z doesn't really feel much loyal to companies because we know that it doesn't go the other way. So I wasn't thinking NAFTA. What I was thinking was uh, publicly held companies and shareholder supremacy. That, and that ties in with NAFTA I mean, a little it, bit. Well, it does because it's, NAFTA is one of the reasons why the shareholders might win in a case where a company needs to cut costs. So basically shareholder supremacy, meaning that a bunch of shareholders have interest in the profits of the company. And if the profits of the company are under attack and the company needs to cut costs, maybe then they would outsource the labor and make a whole bunch of layoffs. But basically the shareholders are more important. The shareholders don't give a shit about the employees of the company as long as the employees of the company make them money. Exactly, which is you know what, which is wild to me. I got a notification today that, and I don't have much stock, um, but uh, I got a notification that I received a, a share of some dividend of some stock, and it was so small. I thought to myself, well, people are going to just stop investing in stocks. Not only going to have these these big companies that are investing in stocks, but realistically. No, no, no. You, you are going to lose the sell of owning stocks is greatly decreased, especially in our generation. Disagree. You can, but I, I mean, I looked at that and I, th I thought to myself, man, I should have this money in Bitcoin. Or maybe I mean, not if you don't want to have that money anymore, then Bitcoin's a great place to put it. <laughs> but I like, I like that's to buy high and sell low. That's, that's, my, that's my cryptocurrency investment. Strategy. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of millennials and Gen Z just don't really have a lot of expectations of loyalty from companies and kind of the, the new normal. And this is, you're starting to see this even being recommended is like moving companies every two to four years. Yeah, you definitely, you definitely do see that, uh, a lot more often because the options are out there, but, um, but that's that's a that's a that is a tough one. Uh, the companies are not doing a great job to keep people there. It's 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 funny when you and I've heard this happen a bunch of times. It's funny when you work for a company and you've been working there say five years and they're hiring new people with zero experience or limited experience who have obviously not worked at the company before and they're being paid at a greater rate than you are. I mean, that's a huge middle finger to, to enfranchised employees. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really not fair. And that's, that's fucked up, in my opinion. Uh, I, I would, in that case, probably go find somewhere else to work uh, just as well. Well, and, and Kevin says, when you get paid more to jump ship, you don't stay loyal. And, and that's, I mean, he's right. Why, why, why stay somewhere when you can make more money somewhere else? Well, it's not always about money. But that is a probably one of the greatest factors. I mean, here in microeconomics, the central tenet is people respond to incentives. Yeah. And while there are certainly other incentives besides money when it comes to jobs, I would say that money is far and away the number one incentive for working a job. Um, all right. I just want to touch on the answer to the bar trivia question because I'm watching the clock here. So I'm just trying to throw it in there. Um, Sponge. Mm, mm, yeah, that's right. I will give it to you. I will give it to you. Um, the more it, uh, the more it dries, the wetter it gets. And I had towel. Um, and I was going to give you paper towel because we were talking about towels before him, but I'll give you the answer. I'll give you the, I'll give you the, uh, you got it with sponge. Um, same idea. And, uh, I have a real bar trivia question at the end of this episode. I think it's pretty easy, but 
we'll see if you can get it. And we got about 25 minutes to go before that, before that pops in. All right. Can we talk about, let's see, relationship with work. Um, you saw my couple paragraphs on relationship to work here. Um, basically about work ethic, when people are getting up, waking up, starting work. Uh, whereas old people will send out emails at five o'clock in the morning because that's when they're awake. Um, to how often people check their email, how often people leave voicemails. So basically, older people are more likely to send emails early in the morning because they're awake. They expect them to be answered by the time they arrive to the office. Um, Not um, happening. <laughs> listen, if uh, listen, if I send you an email, and I guess maybe I occupy, I'm not going to send an email at 530 in the morning. Uh, and if I do, I'm not expecting an answer right away. But I, I would probably... email at 5.30 in the morning. It means that I am hammered. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing at the back of my head. Um, but I, to a degree, expect an answer on that email. If I send you an email, especially if it's work-related and you work for the company, I expect an answer within the next couple hours. If I send a text, I expect an answer much sooner. And it's very frustrating for me to watch somebody walk in with their phone in their hand playing Instagram and and not have texted me or emailed me back. Uh, <laughs> Kevin says, boss makes a dollar, I make a dime. That's why I poop on company time. Yeah, that is that is true. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Experience trumping education. Uh, Generation X education creativity. Uh, account for something. Let's see. What do I, what else do I want to add here? Email. Oh, basically how generation, the newer generation, millennials, um, don't like to talk on the phone. They'll send emails. They'll send texts. Uh, they try not to pick up the phone. And a lot of them don't even leave voicemails. You're not a voicemail guy. I don't, I don't think you've ever left me a voicemail. Um, and I know you didn't have voicemail. For I didn't great, have voicemail for the longest time. The greater portion of the last two decades. <laughs> so. If I'm leaving you a voicemail, the only reason I'm doing so is like, hey, my bail is $800. <laughs> Come to Leeds Avenue. <laughs> Did I leave you that voicemail? <laughs> no, no, no. You called uh, me at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> you didn't have to leave me a voicemail. I already had the keys in my hand. But right. Like, yeah, I, I hate leaving voicemails. I hate listening to voicemails. And there I, I'm kind of in the middle on phone calls. I think that most cases, text messages are better. But there are certainly times where a phone call is more appropriate. The thing is, if we have if I just tell uh, people that if there's a conversation, it happens on the phone. If it's a, like information point, it can be text. It can be sent in a text. It doesn't need to be sent in many paragraphs by text. Uh, and yeah, it all depends on how complicated the issue is that you're that you're I mean, trying to solve. Is, the thing is, I don't want to be texting back and forth for eight or ten minutes. That's right. a phone call, and that's probably a thirty second phone call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so yeah, if it's if it's a simple like question and answer, text message. If it's a discussion where you have to figure things out, phone call. Um, but well, like boomers, boomers will give you will will give you a call uh, with something that could have been a text. Yeah, and the call is going for going to be for them to have you come in and meet in person, so they can tell it to you then. But, yeah, but even like even for like I, I work remote, and um, one of my bosses is very much a boomer, and there will be times where he'll give me a call and give me instructions like you could have sent this in an email or a text message, and I would have gotten to the exact same result. Like this, this was this didn't need to be a phone call. Other times it does, but most of the time. What, what a phone call is could have easily been a text message. Um, I also have some notes here about Generation Y being perfectly okay with never meeting any of their colleagues. And right on the money there, uh, you were saying how uh, <laughs> you work remotely. Yeah. And, and although they, I, yeah, This is a job that you've never worked out of their office, right? You, you're, yeah, you've no, I've been to their job. office. You've been I, to, but, but, yeah. you never, but you didn't used to work at the office and then went remote. You, no, you I went, went when, I, when I first got hired, I went out there for two weeks and was training in the office. That's and so nice. I've met most of the people that I need to work with. Like I've met them in person, but 
I mean, at this point, 99.9% of the time that I'm working, I am not working with them in person. Do you, uh, you do Zoom calls? Microsoft Teams, same idea. With video on? No. Oh, with video off? Oh, that would drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> I So I teach a, a class every Thursday morning. We've talked about this before. And I do it in person and I do it on Zoom. Um, and this is the first week I actually just cut the Zoom off and said, if you guys want to, if you want to come to this class, you need to come in person. And that was tricky because I like, I like people knowing the content of the meeting who can't make it in. However, what I'm finding based off the number of questions that people ask me and what the questions are that they ask me, no one is learning outside of that room. <laughs> they're just not, they're not learning by, by Zoom. I can't see them because I'm focused on the class uh, and I'm focused on the content and the material that I'm teaching. Uh, and it just seems like if you want to learn, you want to be successful, you can show up. Being a real estate agent isn't really a job that you can phone in. It's not a job you can work remotely. Uh, you know, maybe once you get good at it, you can hire an assistant who's going to do a great deal of it for you. But if you want to learn, you got to be boots on the ground. And it's also a people based business. So like you are your brand, how you interact is, yeah. is your, uh, so Kazi uh, says you sound like a boomer now. I'm not sure if he's addressing that to you or me. He's However, probably talking to me. I, I, um, but you know, there are a few things that I think the boom uh, that I'm actually with the boomers on. Yeah, I'm probably with them on a, a few more things than you are. Um, uh, let's see. Um, here, here's my number one. Having a physical menu at a, at a restaurant. Oh God. I, I, I hate not having a physical menu, uh, at a restaurant. I will ask for it. Uh, and, and oftentimes if they, if they're like, no, sorry, we only have the QR code. I'll just say, all right, what, what should I order? Uh, I'll, I'll go one further and be like, look, if you can't give me a, like a menu then I'm not ordering from you. <laughs> they probably don't give a shit. Look, there's been uh, t- like, there's been times where that was the only way I was able to get a menu and say, look, if you don't give me a menu, I'm not ordering, I'm just leaving. Like, oh, we'll see if we can find something for you. All right. I want to run through some values and characteristics just real quick, starting with boomers. Boomers, uh, work ethic, competitiveness, optimism, and some association with civil rights, feminism, and the environment. Generally, Which is odd because I, I, I like today I kind of see them as standing in the way of a lot of those things. Yeah, but also they were there in the 60s, right? They were there That's true. trying to be liberated and have uh, – I mean, they, they were on the forefront of it in many aspects, but yeah. but it's also short sightedness that they're kind of fighting back on some things now. Well, um, I, I think in, I, I've had this conversation with my mother, who is a boomer, and she agrees. I, I think one of the kind of characteristics of boomers today is encapsulated in the fuck you, I've got mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also been a long time since the 1960s. So true. Uh, all right. Generation X 65 to 80, uh, independent skepticism, resourcefulness, also known as the latchkey generation. So trying to figure out why, cause I think beyond talking about these characteristics is like asking why why they were more independent why yeah, they like were, or why they how did ethical? these how did these characteristics come about what was it about their upbringing or the environment that that brought about these kind of generational differences because here, here's something that's funny to me actually is like boomers a lot of boomers will like complain about like participation trophies and stuff yeah and Participation trophies started becoming popular at the time that boomers were parents. <laughs> like, if you think about it, like when we were little kids, like we got participation trophies. Our parents were the boomers. Yeah, they were the ones that were the coaches and the people. Like, yeah, they were the, the ones league. giving yeah. out the participation trophies. Yeah. Um. I don't. I don't know where that intersects. It, that's. Uh... That is, I, I, my guess is like the independence and the skepticism is probably from having like two parents that worked. So you had a lot more time on your own. I think the skepticism. So if you're a generation X born 65 to 80, 
like you would have been a kid like after Nixon's impeachment, which led to a tremendous amount of cynicism about the government. And so and then like while Reagan was president, you had things like the Iran Contra affair that again and like and this one's still being debated about like whether the CIA was like selling drugs to be able to like buy to buy weapons and stuff. But I think you really started to see in the 70s and 80s more information about questionable practices of the government coming out to light, which led to the Gen X becoming really skeptical of things. We're like, we've been lied to for a really long time, and now we're finding out about it. Yeah, well, that and that also with the the media was uncovering a lot more. Yeah, I mean, you're right on, on multiple levels. The media was uncovering a lot more than they ever had before. They're seeing these people grew up. Uh, Generation X grew up with TVs in the household, for most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in probably the older ones, you know, one black and white television. Um, sure, but that's... But by 1980, televisions were very common and some people having multiple televisions in the house. So, uh, and then they yeah. grew up from there. Uh, let's, let's hit millennials next, 81 to 1996. Optimistic, tech savvy. They worked on social issues. They were concerned with work-life balance. Uh, and they valued experiences over possessions. I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I I do De- definitely these pers- these guys uh, were born kind of into technology. Somewhere else, I think I have uh, digital natives. Uh, actually, well, I have that's that's Gen Z. Gen Z. But you know what? You know, but the, a lot of these guys. I mean, if you were born in 1996, um, you were you were. But, you know, by the time you were five years old or so, computers were everywhere. I want to talk about three things that shaped millennials. Uh, Pepsi? No. Oh. Well, I mean, I mean, directly, <laughs> Pepsi would have shaped some millennials if you drank too much of it. <laughs> you drank too much of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. you get more rounder shape. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. So what else shaped millennials? I think there are three, like... Two of them are kind of like actual events, and one of them is more of a trend that I'm going to treat as an event. So the first one is like millennials grew up in the time when computers went from like kind of a niche thing that you'd see every once in a while to being ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So millennials, I think, are the most technologically engaged generation in terms of like knowing what it was like before technology. That's that's what I was going to say is they, they a lot of these guys existed on both sides of the the digital boom so that's the first one is they know what millennials are the generation that experienced the advent of the computer in in its modern sense the second event is 9 11 because most millennials were in kind of pretty formative years because we were 15 when it happened yeah so we got to see the world change radically and we were old enough to be able to appreciate what was going on. And we, I mean, for one, like watching that live coverage, if you think about it, like that was traumatizing. You, you know, every once in a because you can't see a lot of that live footage anymore because it's literally people committing suicide. On live TV. Yeah, and I don't, I'm not talking about the people on the planes. I'm talking about the people jumping out of the windows. And that was mm-hmm. the one thing that I really took home. And then I just went home and sat in front of the TV watching these people jump out of windows uh, over and over again because they were replaying the footage from earlier in the yeah, day. Yeah, but we were watching it live on TV in school. And the, Yeah, and we were watching it live on TV in school. And then I think we closed early. We went home, continued to watch it. And then all the pictures on the front page of the newspaper the following day were either the two towers on fire or a plane about to go in or – a body as it fell from one of the towers. Yeah. And uh, Kazuya, there, there were a number of video clips of people jumping out of the windows of the twin towers because like they knew that they weren't going to be able to cross below the floors that were on fire. Like, and to think like that was a really shaping event for our generation of just like, I mean, I can't even really describe what it feels like to think about what that day was like again. It, it just, it was so weird, but that that's the, the third one came shortly afterwards, which is the advent and eventual dominance of social media. Because again, we're on both sides of this one. We were 
we were old enough to remember what the world was like before social media. We were the ones who really kind of propelled it to the success that it has today. Well, we were the early adopters. We were the early adopters. And I would say because we were the early adopters, we were the ones that helped popularize it and mainstream it. And we, we can see the benefits and costs of social media, I would argue, better than any other generation because we grew up without it well, we and saw, with it. But we saw the world change. We saw mm-hmm. relationships change and people interacting change. Um, let's let's move on to Generation Z, 1997, born 1997 to 2012. And a lot of these guys grew up having this social media, having this interconnectivity. Uh, I, I know Instagram, I think, came out in 2012. Um, Facebook was out halfway through the previous decade, I think 2006. Facebook was 2004. Of 2004? Okay. Well, maybe it became more popular 2006, 2007 outside of the initial universities. Um, and But these guys grew up with it from the get-go. Yep. So there's, a, there's a huge difference, I think, between between Generation X, uh, I'm sorry, between Millennials and Generation Z. There is, and I think it all comes, I, I think the biggest difference is having your childhood being shaped and developed within the environment of social media. Well, think I- about Think about all the stupid things that we did when we were kids that are lost to history. The only people that know about those things that we did are us if we talk about them. Yeah. And Whereas the people- so many people in Gen Z and Gen Alpha or whatever are recording everything they're doing. And I can tell you, like, I am so glad that things I did between the age of 10 and 20 we're not we're not on video. Yes. <laughs> there's no there's no permanent uh, uh, record of them somewhere online. I I completely agree with you. I was I I was thinking slightly different that like uh, younger people don't have any control over like I I don't think I've ever seen your baby pictures. Okay, but anybody born past 2012 probably exists on their parents' Instagram page. Yeah, they, you know, they're, they're the years. digital sharing generation and. I, it's also the digital comparison generation, which I think is a, a large reason why there's so much anxiety and depression among Gen Z is because they've spent their entire lives forcibly being compared to others, which I, and I've talked about a number of times on this cast about social media. And well, you have more than a big comparison, comparing your life directly to someone else's to the comparing your real life to someone else's online life every day, all day. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, I will tell you, I don't, I, I've been really good the last six months or so with really spending not much time on social media. Um, but I sit in an office and I watch people all day long and I can see what they're doing. And I listen, I'm on the train and I look every day. I look around on the train and of course I look at people's screens because they're just right there. And they're the only things that are lit up. Everybody is on Instagram or Twitter or yeah. Snapchat well, or TikTok. I got two things to say about Gen Z. The first is although they've grown up with technology their entire lives, their actual skills with technology are really quite poor. And here's an example. This um, this is not about a Gen Z person. This is an example about like abilities you use technology does not mean skill with technology. And the example I'll give is like someone says, oh, look at my four-year-old playing with the iPad. They're so good. They're so intuitive. In reality, it's the software engineers that made the iPad were really good that they made it so easy that a four-year-old could use it. Yeah, but nowadays people don't even understand what code is. They okay, but you don't you get my point. Yeah, no, exactly. It's been made easy. It's been made so that a baby can use. Yeah. The baby isn't isn't just that great at using technology. It's just they made technology so easy to understand that anybody can use it, yeah, even if, a four-year-old. If, if you gave a four-year-old an old-school camcorder, they would not know what to oh, do no. with it. <laughs> so that's my first point, is despite their tremendous exposure to technology, I think, writ large, they're not that great with using it. Well, and the I, second one is, like, Gen Z is the school shooter generation. Oh, I was going to talk more about the technology, but yeah. Uh, that 
that is more true. Although, did we have there? I think millennials were the first ones shooting schools, right? Well, yes, because Columbine. Columbine was 1999. Yeah. So I'm not saying like, and again, there's some overlap here, but like, if you look at like the historic instant incidence rates of school shootings, like when they spiked and really had an impact, that's Gen Z. Gen Z is more impacted by school shooters than any well, other generation. Listen, and I, I don't, I'm not going to attribute that to them being like weaker mentally or, or social media making them feel worse about themselves. Although maybe that the second one is more possible, more possible, but I think especially now that you see so much more of it. So they, they used to see big increases in suicides when there'd be a suicide uh, in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the copycat right? effect. It's it, it's just when you're thinking about it, it's in your mind now. It's something to do. I just heard somebody on the on the radio this morning or in a, I think I was doing a book, an audio book, talking about like teaching a class of, of toddlers. Like, hey, don't put the beans in your ears. And before you know it, nine kids are sticking beans in their ears because it just occurred to them that they could do yeah. So now, you know, and I will tell you, social media isn't just a way to be social, but it's a way to spread information. And it could be news. News isn't necessarily social. So you're spreading all these ideas. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not sure the exact cause, but I'm guessing that's an attribute to. Well, to the I mean, I'm, I'm really talking about like Gen Z, like their focus on mental health. The reason why they're like so concerned with mental health is because I think they're the most affected by mental health issues that the prevalence rate in Gen Z is higher than any other generation. And also like so many school shootings have happened to Gen Z that just mental health has a high saliency to them. Yeah, I, I, I will agree. Uh, like I'm not blaming Gen Z for this. I'm saying it has had a huge effect on Gen Z. And I really do think that in the coming election with something like, three or four million Gen Z voters becoming eligible to vote from the past presidential election. I think Gen Z is pissed off. And I, I think they're, I think they are more politically active than disaffected millennials and disaffected Gen X. And I think you're going to see them come out and vote in droves. And I think one of the big things for them is gun control because of their uh, how affected they've been by school shootings. Yeah, I, I mean, can see them voting on that issue and also abortion because they, again, care about being able to make choices for themselves. Yeah, I mean, and those were not issues for us. We didn't have we didn't have uh, active school shooter drills as no, kids. we had uh, fire we got, drills, but like I got to hit I got to hit this uh, bar trivia question. And we got to see our way out of this topic. Bar trivia question. Episode 239, catch the answer to this in episode 240. In Canada, it, it is illegal to bury a man who lives in the U.S. Why is that? Can you repeat the question? In Canada, don't Google this one, it is illegal to bury a man who lives in the U.S. Why is that? No, don't answer it, please. We'll give the answer next episode. Uh, uh, real quick, I want to hit Kevin's comment. He says, the better the technology when you grow up, the less your knowledge your generation will have of it. Most people of our generation don't know much about car, car maintenance compared to previous generations. Which is which is wild, but also maintaining a car in your own garage or driveway these days is is, is much more difficult. Well, uh, yeah, because so much it's so much yeah. more electronic. Like, yeah. you, I'll tell you, my thing with technology that I see every day is... Old people can't use computers like desktop computers. Yep. And now young people can't use desktop computers either. And that's well, I mean, that's going this. back to a point I made 10 minutes ago. Yeah. It's, it's just like, <laughs> come on. That, well, that's that's the camcorder uh, example that I gave, but just more palatable because it's not as, as old of a thing. Uh, I like desktop computers. I happen to like them. Um, all right. That's the end of this episode. Anything I'm missing here? I mean, there's a lot I'm missing on on generations um, had marriage rates over the uh, age of marriage over the generations. Oh yeah. We can talk about, and, and, and it also and comes it just, to like social conservatism. conservatism. Listen, long, long story short on, on average age of marriage over the generations is it just continues to trend upwards. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you can, I think millennials and Gen Z are seeing like, Mar like marriage to a lesser extent, but children to a greater extent of like 
why we can't afford anything why why do you think we can afford kids <laughs> on that note we are out of here thank you for joining all right that concludes this fireside chat thank you for joining looking forward to seeing you next time and uh adios i like pbr i just got priced out of it <laughs>